So uh, over next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, I'll be discussing the role of cetagliptin uh, in patients of type 2 diabetes mellitus. This is the best uh, approach. So I will discuss a uh, hypothetical case, though it is a hypothetical case, but uh, I would believe that uh, like me, you do also test these sort of cases in your day-to-day -day clinical practice. So this is a newly detected uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus patient, 42-year-old male, uh, detected during an annual health checkup. He is a software engineer and uh, he is uh, following sedentary lifestyle, but normotensive and non-smoker and non-alcoholic. So with regards to his clinical finding, uh, he had nothing abnormality in his clinical finding, but uh, biochemically, obviously, uh, he has hyperglycemia, fasting plasma glucose, postprandial, as well as HbOnc was high. HbOnc was 9.1%. So what should be the uh, management protocol for this patient? So definitely, there are many options for managing type 2 diabetes mellitus in a newly detected type 2 diabetes mellitus. So unless and until it is contraindicated, we should always start with metformin. But if uh, in some situations, like if there is established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or diabetic kidney disease or heart failure, we need to choose uh, between GLP-1 receptor agonist and SGL2 inhibitor. But in otherwise, uh, we have many other uh, oral options uh, as I have mentioned, metformin, after that we have uh, sulfonylureas, we have DP4 inhibitor and obviously SGL2 inhibitor and also glitazone, AGI. So what to choose? Uh, should we start with metformin? Should we start with fixed dose combinations of metformin or uh, with SGL2 inhibitor or DP4 inhibitor? Or should we start with DP4 inhibitor alone? Or should we start with SGL2 inhibitor alone for this patient? So we need to individualize. So. Uh, our management goal should be long-term durability of glycemic control in a, in a newly detected type 2 diabetes mellitus patient who is uh, otherwise uh, healthy, not having other comorbidities like hypertension, dyslipidemia, or obesity. So our primary goal is to uh, have durable glycemic control, but uh, it is not easy to achieve target glycemic goal always, particularly in Indian scenarios. And we know that uh, glycemic control is very poor in Indian diabetic uh, subjects with a mean HbOnc of approximately 8.9%. And in a study by Dr. Mohan and et al., which was published in 2014, it was seen only 19.7% of Indian diabetic patients, they achieved their target HbOnc goal of less than 7%. And in another uh, global study, it was seen that 47% of patients do not achieve the glycemic target even after or triple drug so it is not ready to achieve the target glycemic goal or else and that is our uh, experience also says the uh, same thing uh, the clinical practice uh, we have seen uh, many cases that they are not under control so monotherapy uh, very often fails to achieve the target glycemic uh, control this is also uh, uh, experienced in these studies uh, it was seen that after a period of five years the rosiglitazone failed in 15% of patients and metformin failed in 21% of patients and glyburate, which is a very potent sulfo uh, sulfonylid insulin secret drug, which failed in 34% of cases. This is because of its uh, insulin-dependent or insulin secretory mechanism of action because we know type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease and there is always progression of beta cell loss because of apoptosis of beta cell. So that's why the sulfonylurea failed uh, and, and the faster. So, uh, monotherapy is not always uh, adequate to achieve the glycemic control that is uh, reflected in these studies. So, in another study, uh, which was a retrospective analysis from UK Clinical Practice Research Data Link database, which includes more than 93,000 uh, uh, patients, it was seen that uh, depending on the time uh, when uh, the treatment was intensified, it was classified that uh, into three categories. Uh, early intensification, intermediate in intensification, and late in intensification. Uh, where uh, early intensification, the patients are intensified uh, bit, uh, in a period of less than one year, and uh, in case of intermediate intensification, 
treatment was intensified between 12 to 24 months and in case of uh, late intensification in, uh, treatment intensified between 24 to 36 months so it was seen in that studies that likelihood of attaining glycemic control was 22 percent and 28 percent lower for patients in the intermediate and late intensification group respect, uh, respectively compared to intensifying early and and uh, it was significant so durability of glycemic control is very easy to talk but it is very difficult to achieve so uh, that is because the type 2 diabetes mellitus is a progressive disease and there is always decline in beta cell function and clinical inertia are also another important roadblocks in achieving this target glycemic goal. Uh, but we need to try to at least try to achieve the durable glycemic control for initial uh, few years so that we can maintain and achieve the near normal glycemic goal and, uh, and can prevent long term microvascular and macrovascular complications. So uh, guideline also suggests the same thing that uh, if the initial uh, uh, blood glucose level or HbA1c level is very high, uh, say for example, according to the ADA, if the HbA1c is more than 9% and according to the AAC and uh, AAC guideline, if the uh, entry HbA1c is more, than, more or equal to 7.5%, we should always start with uh, dual therapy or combination therapy in a drug navy patients. So now uh, let us uh, have a look uh, on the efficacy and safety of cetagliptin uh, in comparison to other therapies. So in a study of 24 weeks period, it was seen that uh, in a uh, patient's population, so the baseline hb one c uh, was more than 7.2%, cetagliptin reduced hb one c uh, of 0.43 percent point and metformin reduced 0.57 percent point. And uh, in another subgroup where the baseline HbA1c uh, was more or equal to 8%, cetagliptin reduced HbA1c by 1.13% and metformin reduced HbA1c by 1.24%. Uh, and HbA1c goal uh, of less than 7% and 6.5% was achieved in 69% and 34% patients with cetagliptin respectively and 76% and 39% patients uh, with metformin only. And there was also body weight reduction in both the arm. So, the, uh, and in the same study, it was seen that the incidence of hypoglycemia was very less, 1.7% with cetagliptin and 3.3% uh, with metformin. And incidence of uh, gastrointestinal related adverse events was also very less with cetagliptin compared to metformin. And this is primarily because of significantly decreased incidence of diarrhea and nausea with uh, cetagliptin. So, cetagliptin was found to be non inferior to metformin in improving HbA1c in treatment of type 2 diabetes mellitus patients, which was generally well tolerated with a lower incidence of GI related adverse effects. Now, coming to uh, the comparison between cetagliptin and metformin in a patient uh, uh, who is type 2 diabetes mellitus uncontrolled with metformin. So, in a study at the end of 30 weeks, it was seen that 52% and 60% of patients were with an HbA1c level less than 7%, which, which was the target in the cetagliptin and glimepride group, respectively. And mean change in HbA1c was 0.47% with cetagliptin and 0.54% with glimepride. And as we know, that glimepride is a very potent insulin signal. That's why there, there was better HbA1c reduction, but the uh, difference was not significant. And with regards to fasting plasma glucose change, fasting uh, plasma glucose was uh, reduced by 0 0.8 millimole with cetagliptin and 1 millimole per liter with glimepride. And cetagliptin was also associated with a mean weight loss, whereas glimepride was associated with a mean weight gain of 1.2 kg. 1, 1 so uh, in the same study, it was also seen the hypoglycemia was reported in 7% uh, patients uh, with cetagliptin and 22% of patients with glimepride. So addition of cetagliptin to ongoing metformin monotherapy provided similar HbA1c lowering efficacy after 30 weeks of treatment compared with addition of glimepride with a substantially lower rate of hypoglycemic events. Now coming to cetagliptin with metformin efficacy uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus uncontrolled with metformin. At the end of 24 weeks, it was seen that the HbA1c reduction with cetagliptin was 0.67% point and uh, in the placebo arm, it was 0.02% point. Uh, 
And uh, with regards to fasting plasma glucose chains over a period of 24 weeks, fasting plasma glucose was reduced uh, in this, with the cetagliptin by 0.9 millimole per liter. So there was no increased risk of hypoglycemia and gastrointestinal adverse events also with cetagliptin compared to placebo in the study and body weight decreased similarly with cetagliptin and placebo and cetagliptin 100 mg once daily added to the ongoing metformin therapy in the study was effective and safe in patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus who have been inadequately controlled with metformin. Now coming to the uh, efficacy of cetagliptin metformin fixed dose combination versus metformin in treatment, maybe uh, type 2 diabetes mellitus patients after a period of 18 weeks, you can see that there is significant reduction of HB1C over the period of 18 weeks in the, with the cetagliptin metformin fixed dose combination versus metformin and between group difference of 0.6 percent point. And in the uh, cetagliptin metformin fixed dose combination, there is a reduction of 2.4 percent of HB1C. And as we know that higher the baseline is C, more is the is C reduction efficacy with any molecule. So uh, that was similarly seen in that study in a subgroup of uh, patients where the median is C was more than 9.7 percent point. There was a maximum reduction of is C of 3.2 percent point. And in the same study, body weight change from baseline was 1.6 kg in both the arm. And both treatment are generally well tolerated with a low and similar incidence of hypoglycemia, but abdominal pain and diarrhea occurred significantly less with cetagliptin and metformin fixed dose combinations. So compared with metformin monotherapy alone, initial treatment with cetagliptin metformin fixed dose combinations provided superior glycemic improvement with a similar degree of weight loss and lower incidence of abdominal pain and diarrhea. Now coming to the subgroup analysis from the same study, you can see that uh, in the subgroup of patients where so the baseline HB1C was more than 7.5% to, uh, to less than 9%, uh, in that subgroup, 69.4% of patients, they achieved the target HB1C level of less than 7%. And also, as I have uh, mentioned that uh, higher the baseline uh, HB1C, higher, uh, more is the HB1C lowering efficacy that was also justified in that study that in uh, patient subgroup where the baseline HB1C is more than 19%, there was highest HB1C reduction by 3.6 percent point. So the greatest mean HB1C reduction 3.6 percent occurred in the cetagliptin metformin fixed dose combination statement group of patients in the baseline HB1C of subgroup of more than or equal to 9, uh, 11 percent. So in type 2 diabetic mellitus patients with the baseline HB1C of more than 7.5%, uh, but less than 9%, substantially more number of patients achieved the HB1C goal of less or equal to 6.5% with initial dual therapy than with initial monotherapy, that is metformin. Now coming to the durability of uh, 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 glycemic reduction, benefit of cetagliptin in this respect. So this is a study where you can see in press, and O2 study, that is persistent cetagliptin treatment and outcome study, long-term results after five years. So uh, there was uh, sustained reduction of HB1C uh, over a period of uh, 72 months. And the maximum reduction was, uh, initial maximum reduction was after four to six months, and that persisted till uh, five years with the cetagliptin uh, compared to no cetagliptin. So coming back to the case, the, this patient was started on dual therapy of metformin 1000 mg and cetagliptin 100 mg. Uh, so as uh, uh, guided by the guideline, the patient was advised for follow-up uh, visit after three months. So the patient's blood glucose came down to fasting 118 p uh, pp 1 and 58, HB on C 7.2 percent point. Uh, and blood pressure was normal. So patient was advised to continue the same medications, uh, that is metformin 1000 milligram and cetagliptin 100, 100 milligram. So the patient was also advised to follow up every three months. So after six, six months, now uh, blood glucose is normal, fasting 92 postprandial 110 and HB1C 6.3% of the patient, which is the desired target for this patient because this is a newly detected young type 2 diabetes mellitus having no other uh, uh, comorbidities. So the, uh, tar our target is stringent for this patient, which is less than 6.5%. So the patient was advised to continue the same medications that is cetagliptin metformin uh, fixed dose combinations, uh, and patient was advised to follow up every three months.
So my conclusion: extensive clinical trial and real-world uh, data, which was also uh, mentioned by the chairperson, sir, that uh, has firmly established the glycemic efficacy of sitagliptin as monotherapy, as initial uh, combination therapy, and also as an add-on therapy with other ways in adult patients with type 2 diabetes mellitus patients. And sitagliptin is generally well tolerated with most uh, adverse events being of mild to moderate intensity, particularly. Uh, Uh, about the upper GI side effect like nausea, abdominal pain, and which is relatively, uh, which is uh, seen relatively few patients who discontinue treatment because of these events. And according to the guideline, uh, if there is no established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or heart failure or CKD, uh, and there is a compelling need to maintain the body weight, there is a compelling need to avoid hypoglycemia, then we can choose a, uh, the, this class of drug that is DB4 inhibitor. Among the other classes like SGLT2 inhibitor and also GLP-1 receptor agonist, so definitely there is a scope for this molecule in management of type 2 diabetes mellitus, particularly in in a patient who is newly detected and having no other uh, no other complications. So even if there is any complications like established uh, thyroid cardiovascular disease or diabetic kidney disease or heart failure, but GLP-1 receptor agonist or SGLT2 receptor uh, inhibitor is contraindicated or intolerant uh, intolerated uh, by the patients. Then uh, there is a scope for using this molecule that is DB4 inhibitor. So with these, I would like to stop here.